Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. These Sundays here, uh, throughout the summer, I have invited you to give me your songs so I could preach on them. Um, I've been angling mainly for secular songs, no churchy religious hymn sort of songs, just secular songs. And that's what we've been doing all the Sundays I've been here. But today I'm actually going to step back from that. Um, And I just kind of changed my mind, felt God calling us to a a different way of talking, a different conversation this morning than the song route. Um, And it happened since Wednesday, because I actually sat with the Wednesday morning Bible study, and we listened to Climb Every Mountain, and we talked through how the sermon might be for that uh, that morning. Um, But things have changed since Wednesday morning. They've changed in our world, and they've changed in our country, and they've changed, I think, for us as people living here in Aliquippa um, since Wednesday. And I think God calls us to talk about that in this morning, um, and especially given the gospel that has been put up for us this morning, the story we just heard of the Good Samaritan. So this morning's story is not going to be about the song Climb Every Mountain. It's going to be about the Good Samaritan. It's going to be about us thinking about the Good Samaritan, an ironic name for the parable, the Samaritan story, um, through the lens of all that's happened in the world over the last week. Um, We're going to start off, though, here with playing, it's not a song, but a little bit of an interview that uh, just this incredible man gave in Dallas, Texas. His name is Kellen Nixon. Um, Stacy actually clued me into this, uh, this interview, and the whole interview is about nine minutes long. We're only going to listen to about three or so minutes of it. Um, he's, a, he's a man that lives in Dallas, and he and his five-year-old son, Elijah, were at the peace rally in March this week um, that, fit, that ended with a gunman shooting at police officers. And so he was there in that moment with his, with his son, and so this interviewer catches him the next day kind of at ground zero where it all happened, and he has this conversation with this Mr. Nixon and talks about that moment. And so he's already talked a little bit about what it was like in those moments of gunfire and, and how he responded with his son and other people around. And now he kind of takes a step back and reflects on the largeness of that situation. And he says some really amazing things that maybe can get us thinking about this moment and as we get towards the story of the Samaritan. Joe, if you would. All in all, you know, I hate that th- this is what actually will be remembered you know, that this is what the people will remember, you know, that a few, um, that the worst of people will give us a perception of our people. You know, it's, it's just horrible that we have so many stereotypes, you know, um, I stereotype police, police stereotype me. And that's where all the hatred comes from. But, you know, in all honesty, if we could get past our stereotypes, I think we'd be a lot better if we could. Amen to that. Uh, how are you today? Today, I'm, um, I'm, I think I'm recovering spiritually today, you know, because, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? I mean, last night, when you start to see the shooting and hear the shooting and you've got your son there and your, your, your main concern is, I better get this boy home to his mother or she's going to kill me. You know, um, you start to think it's me against the world, you know, and with that type of mentality, we'll, we'll implode as a people, we'll implode, not as ethnicity as a people, but I mean as a people, period. We're all one race at the end of the day. If we get a me against the world mentality last night, I was thinking maybe it's not black lives matter or all lives matter. Maybe it's just my life matter. Maybe it's just the fam- my family's life matters. And, you know, I had to recover from that spiritually. I had to be reminded that, you know, that God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I had to be reminded that love conquers all, because if I let that mentality overwhelm me, then who can I help? And how can I teach him? How can I raise him? What did you, uh, how old is he? He's five. What, what's his name? Elijah. What did you tell Elijah uh, this morning about what happened last night? Well, we, we actually talked about it last night. Um, I, you know, I explained to him that we wanted to be, we wanted to be a part of something. You know, we wanted to have our voices um, to support um, Mr. Castile as well as Austin Sterling, you know, and, and the countless African-Americans that have died. Um, but then when we began to speak about it, you know, I, I wanted to let him know that you can't be afraid of police officers, that you can't hate police officers, that you can't judge the same way you wouldn't want a man judging you because of the skin of your color, you can't judge a man because of the color of the uniform that they wear. You know, I, I've been in a position where at a point in my life I sold drugs. And the honest truth is that the mercy that was extended to me wasn't by other drug dealers. It wasn't by African-American men. But it was by two 
Anglo-American officers that found me with drugs and they extended me mercy. And from there, I was able to be a husband. I was able to be a father. I'm a pastor and a preacher now. And at the same time, when I'm in a three-piece suit from the police, I'm treated worse than when I was a thug. So it, it proves to me that everybody's not bad, that everybody wearing a badge is not bad, that every, every African-American is not bad, but we have to change our, our concepts. We have to change our ideology in, in this country. We're, we're so segregated in everything. We're segregated in our schools still. We're segregated in our religion. We're segregated in churches. And it, it, it destroys us. How, how would you characterize The interview continues on, and I highly encourage you to listen to it. The man's name is Kellen Nixon, and it is a great, great interview. He uses two words that just resound for me overwhelmingly, especially in light of the words from the gospel we just heard. The words, mercy. That's Jesus' final question. Which one showed him mercy? And the word love. This week on the um, late night, sh- whatever, the, the late night show with Stephen Colbert, he began his monologue by saying, um, reminding us that love is a verb and it's an action verb. It's not a passive verb. We don't love like just hanging back and love sitting in our chairs. Loving, loving is an action where we do love. Um, and that's what this story of this parable that Jesus tells is all about. So it starts out, like many of these stories, kind of with the real moment, the, the, the narrative or what was going on, and Jesus tells a parable. And it starts out with this lawyer, probably a Jewish lawyer, trying to trap Jesus, as they often do. Um, what must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks Jesus. Um, and Jesus ref- always responds with questions, it seems like. What does it say in the law? And he recites the law, one of the most important laws in all of Jewish Torah. It is the Shema. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And he combines another part of later on in the Torah, um, and love your neighbor as yourself. And truly, that is the greatest commandment, Jesus says later on. So this guy gets it right. And Jesus says, you have, got, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. And then he tells this story. And again, this isn't a story where I like to say to the Bible study people, if you had a video camera, you would have caught a guy, a Jewish guy walking down the road. It's meant to draw out our imagination, for us to relate our own lives and our own experiences to this story and grab onto Jesus' point. So a Jewish man, the insider, the us, is walking down the path from Jerusalem to Jericho. Steep road, rocky road, big rock cliffs on the side. The road's probably not much wider than our center aisle here. He gets the crap kicked out of him. I mean, literally, he gets beat up so badly, he's left for dead and alongside the road, naked, miserable. And Jesus tells that these two religious guys come walking along. Again, us, the insiders, the we, the our guys. And they come and they see him, and they both walk on the far side, the priest and the Levite. Levite was just another one of the 12 tribes that was all about the religious duties of the society. Then walks along the Samaritan, the Samaritan. Samaritans were an... So I've told the Bible study people before that they were an ancient enemy. Um, as I did some more research this week, Samaritans weren't an ancient enemy in Jesus' day. They were a very present enemy in Jesus' day. At least that's the way the Jews talked about the Samaritans. It's always from one perspective or another, right? For us, it's them, those awful Samaritans. For about 700 years, 800 years, the Jews had been in opposition to the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were like half-breed of Jew. that They followed some of the Jewish law. They only followed Torah and not the rest of the scriptures. They only followed the, the, the first five books of Pentateuch. Um, they didn't follow the rest of the scriptures. They, after exile, started marrying other people beyond the Jewish people. Um, they were very cast down upon by the Jews, very hated, different skin color, wore different clothes, married different people. They, the words hate and enemy were easily used for Jews to Samaritans and Samaritans back towards Jews. Samaritans were up north people. Jews were down south people. Jerusalem, Jericho, down south place. So imagine this encounter. Man on the road, beaten up, naked, left for dead, about to die. The two religious people walk by. This evil, awful Samaritan comes down the path. If you're the Jewish guy, what are you thinking is going to happen in these moments? He's going to push you out of your misery. He's going to kill you. 
he, them, that guy, that awfulness. You can see by the color of his skin as he comes down the road, it is going to turn out bad. Think about it from the Samaritan's perspective. He's walking down the road in enemy, enemy territory. He sees this Jewish guy on the road, his enemy. He's been told all of his life. That's the way he's brought up. That's the stories he heard around his dinner table. He sees this man lying on the, t- on the ground. What's he going to do? What's his people going to think if he does something different than what he's been taught all of his life? All the stereotypes, all the stuff he's been taught. He's heard. He knows about those Jews. He's been told the same sort of stories about them his whole life. When you know this relationship between the Jews and Samaritans, it's what makes this moment so amazing. Because neither one of them do what hundreds and hundreds of years would have dictated that they do. The Samaritan sees the man, the Jewish man. And not only does he see him, but the scriptures say, Jesus' story says, Jesus says, he was moved with pity. Those two religious people, they had three options. I'm stereotyping broadly here, three possibilities. They could have helped, they could have hurt, or they could have been completely ambivalent. They went with ambivalence. They just walked right past and tried not to even be involved. The Samaritan goes with the moved with pity for this man. He's moved with pity so much that he bandages his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, meaning he got off his animal and walked so that the Jewish man could be on the animal. And it says, he took care of him. He had pity on him, and then he took care of him. Then the next day, he took out money, a substantial amount of money, and gave them to an innkeeper and said, you take care of him now, and I will come back. And when I do, I'll repay you whatever more I owe you. Again, this is not his city. This is not his territory. This is not his plan. The way this man steps out of all that society, that his people, that his culture would have expected of him is shocking and amazing. So beautifully, at the end of the story, Jesus looks back at the lawyer and says, okay, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy. That's where we are right now. We're at this moment in time where we can continue to fall upon ancient stereotypes. We can continue to fall into our fears and our own desires to stay away, to be ambivalent, to not care for the other, to not see the humanness in the other. Or we can be people of mercy in this moment. We can be people who stand at peaceful moments, at peaceful marches, at peaceful presentations. We can be people who are merciful to others in shocking and new ways. When we see people who wear headpieces that we don't wear, dress like we don't dress, have skin colors that are not our skin colors, we have the opportunity right now to be people of mercy. I think Jesus kind of sums it up best at the end. Go and do likewise. Amen.